So I guess I'll start. Travis, should I start? Yes, ma'am, feel free to start. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, welcome everybody to Cosmochemistry and Dust. This is our first uh, of, of the Laboratory Astrophysics Oral Sessions, and we're really excited uh, um, for all to present all of these great talks. And um, I don't want to take much time um, to uh, take away from Pierre Hinecourt, our first talk. So we'll just get right into it. And he is um, our first invited speaker from the University of Arizona. And he will be presenting uh, a, a talk called From Stars to the Solar System, Analysis of Stardust Grains in the Laboratory. So uh, we will just let Pierre get started and share his slides. So Pierre, if you're there with your video and and I'll just remind everyone that there's um, we have sessions Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for LAD and the next one will be at 2.50 p.m. Uh, on astrochemistry. So we'll get started with Pierre. Thank you. And Thank you, Richard. So as Richard mentioned, I'm going to talk today about um, Stardust, so grains of dust that form in circumstellar environment that we find today in the solar system. So traditionally, um, observational astronomy have used uh, the light emitted by stars to get large scale information on stellar envelope and um, information about that dust abundance, dust composition. And so you get large scale information about the dust composition. While pre solar grains provide a snapshot of the isotopic composition or the uh, mineralogy or microstructure of uh, dust grain from a given star at a given point in its evolution. So it literally pro uh, provides a snapshot of um, the condition in the star. And so while astronomy can provide the context, pre solar grains provide detailed information on a particular time in the uh, stellar evolution. And it provides con uh, constraining parameters par parameterization for model and uh, mixing. So here I show you as the pre-solar grain constitute bona fide stardust grain, so literally dust condensed in uh, second solar environment. Here I show you three different um, type of uh, grains. So it's secondary electron images showing of grains. So this is a graphite grains and uh, so, uh, silicon carbide grains. So there are uh, uh, three different types of grains that were uh, recent uh, among the first type of pre-solar grain identified. And so as we see, pre-solar grains, they travel all the way to the solar system. So what's the, where the journey uh, to us? And so those grain condensed in circumstellar environment and in uh, stellar ejecta, they were then transported to uh, the multi-molecular cloud. And part of this uh, molecular cloud was then uh, collapsed to form a protoplanetary disk from which the solar system formed. And while most of the material from which, uh, the original material from which the solar system formed was evaporized and we condensed into a new uh, dust grain, a small fraction of the original pre-solar material remained intact and preserved into asteroids and comets. And part of those, oops, part of those asteroids and comets are delivered to the Earth through um, meteorites, interplanetary dust, interplanetary dust particle and a micro meteorite. And we can study them in the lab to identify the pre-solar grains and I'm gonna show you how we actually find them. So pre-solar grains were initially uh, found in um, 1987. So initially the pre-solar nanodiamond were identified in the alien meteorites. Soon after were um, silicon carbide were also identified uh, in the same, uh, uh, in the Murchison meteorite. And then uh, a few years later, graphite were identified. And they were identified because um, large anomaly in noble gases were initially found in um, bulk uh, meteorite and uh, acid dissolution of uh, those a large amount of those meteorites. So they dissolved up to 100 grams of uh, the meteorite, led to the progressive uh, discovery of those pre solar grains. And you can see here the two uh, test tubes show you the, the, the pre solar grains uh, res in the acid residue. And so the, the, the one in the middle are. Uh, the graphite grains the, in the middle of the tube and the one at the bottom, the, the dense dark uh, powder at the bottom are the silicon carbide grains. So since the initial discovery of those three initial pre-solar grain phases, a lot of different types of uh, pre-solar grains have been uh, reported. So there is 
among the carbon rich grain in addition to the diamond graphite and silicon carbide there is a, a series of um, of carbides or uh, car um, like a titanium carbide and nitro and uh, with nitrogen but there is also like a, a large array of oxide and silicate grains including uh, corundum spinel hibonite magnetite and uh, different types of woostite and for silicate there is different type of olivine pyroxene perovskites and um, silica so it's io2 and there is also very minor uh, phases that were also identified mostly as inclusion in uh, carbon issues grain so uh, as diamond and graphite so there is um, small metal nuggets different type of uh, sulfide or uh, silicide there we go so pre-solar grains are very small grains identified in mitride but good to give you some ideas of how small they are so most pre-solar grains uh, are on the order of a microns or less with most pre-solar silicate being on the order of 250 nanometers, but nano diamond are about one to two nanometers in size. So the typical range of pre-solar grains is between one nanometers to up to uh, about 30 microns in size. So they are very, very, very small grains identified in meteorites. And we identified them because they have large as, uh, isotopic anomaly. And so they have isotopic anomaly that's completely different from anything in the solar system. And when we, we talk about isotopic anomaly, we, we use two different notations. So we, and uh, I will um, uh, show you different type of those notation, but the main notation that we use is isotopic ratio. So for example, of our oxygen isotopes, oxygen 17 to oxygen 16 ratio, oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 ratio. But we also use uh, what we call delta notation, which is simply a comparison of the oxygen isotopic ratio of a given sample to a standard. So it's a deviation from the standard. And for the case of ox oxygen, we use SMO, so it's standard mean ocean water. And as you can see here in this uh, diagram on the right side, you can see the delta oxygen 17 in function of the delta uh, 18. And it's a per mil notation because it's a very small uh, variation. And as you can see, most of the material in the solar system is comprised of variation on the order of um, 200 per mil so you can see everything from the sun and all the different planets and meteorites are all fit within those 200 per mil variation while we talk about free solar grains on the other hand we talk about much larger and isotopic anomaly and as you can see so here everything in the solar system actually fit in the in the the center here that's uh, the two the, the cross of the two line uh, labeled as solar system so most pre-solar grains show variation on the order of uh, thousands of per mil. So, so instead of um, and have with variation about uh, up to um, about thirty-five uh, thousand per mil in oxygen seventeen and uh, five up to five uh, ten ten thousand per mil in oxygen eighteen. So it's isotopic anomaly that are so large and so different from anything in the solar system that it cannot be explained with any process that we know in the solar system, and it can only be explained by processing that happen inside of stars and so nucleosidic uh, processes inside of stars. So the discovery of pre-solar grains were initially done as I mentioned in uh, meteorites so in the two famous carbon issues chondrite Allende and Murchison but since then they've been also identified in a lot of different planetary materials so they were identifying in interplanetary dust particles so it's particle collected in the upper stratosphere by uh, NASA and those particles are thought to, to originate uh, from uh, comets. They were also identified in uh, Antarctic micrometrites, which are a uh, small uh, particle uh, collected from um, the Antarctic ice. They were also collected, uh, identified in creators from the Stardust uh, mission. So it's an, uh, another mission that collected samples from the comet Ville 2. And so uh, when particle impacted the collector, the um, the search for pre-solar grains as collectors showed that we found uh, leftover pre-solar grains in the residue of those impacts. They were also uh, recently identified in the uh, Genesis uh, solar wind collector. So it was a collector that was exposed to the solar wind and so the impact into the collector showed the presence of uh, pre-solar grain. Okay. So how do we find them? So there is three different methods that we can we use to find pre-solar grains. As I mentioned, uh, the original method was to uh, use chemical density separation. So they took a large amount of meteorites, up to 100 grams of uh, carbonaceous chondrite, dissolve it uh, progressively, and then use uh, density separation 
to uh, separate uh, the different phases. And this method was used to identify, to identify the three main uh, carbon rich grains, so nano diamond, graphite, and silicon carbide. But this method is, um, cannot be used uh, to identify uh, other pre-solar grain uh, phases, such as pre-solar silicate, because when you uh, do the dissolution, you have to dissolve most of the uh, main component of the mitrad, which is silicate. And so by dissolving most of the silicate, you dissolve also pre-solar silicate. The second method that we use, and the one I've been using, and I will show you the example in the next few slides, is uh, in-situ methods that use uh, that you use a secondary ion mass spectrometry to do um, isotopic mapping of the tin section of a mitrad. So here you can see an area of a tin section in a mitrad, and each brighter box, you can see those patterns of uh, bright square is the one uh, 10 by 10 microns image uh, in the meteorite. And so each of the, we map as much uh, matrix area as possible to literally hunt for pre-solar grains. So we try to ju just find those pre-solar grains hidden in meteorite matrix. More uh, recently also people have used what they call grain size separate. So they just took meteorite matrix and then uh, using uh, uh, liquid nitrogen, they froze, they froze the meteorite, uh, the meteorite matrix and then freeze it really quickly to break it apart and then use grain size uh, separation to basically make size fraction and then deposit that, those uh, different fraction on gold mount to reduce the material that you have to search for to identify pre-solar grains. So here I'm gonna show you one example of um, a, a study I recently uh, published about a, a, a unique pre-solar graphite grains that I identified in a meteorite and show you how we, that provide us information on stellar processes. And so those, those um, the result of those, uh, of that research was published in Nature Astronomy and uh, the Astrophysical Journal. So we carry a, we, we carry a uh, nanosims uh, isotopic raster imaging. So as I mentioned, pre-solar in situ search for pre-solar grain use uh, secondary ion mass spectrometry. So you, here you can see it's, uh, it's a new generation of uh, SIMS instruments. So it's a, it's a nanoscale SIMS instrument. And so it, uh, it has two big advantages. First is the, as its name uh, implied, it's a, it has a nanoscale uh, spatial resolution uh, as, as low as 50 uh, nanometers. And so it allows us to identify any, any grains that are larger than 50 nanometers. But it also has the advantage of having uh, multiple detectors, so between five and seven detectors that allow us then to measure more than one isotope at a time. So as, as you can see uh, in the table uh, on the bottom right, we are able to measure uh, five isotopes at each time with three different runs of measurements. So the initial run uh, to identify the free solar grains, we measure carbon and, um, carbon isotopes and oxygen isotopes, so carbon 12, 13, and then oxygen 16, 17, and 18. And then in a second run, we measured for that particular grain, we also measure nitrogen isotopes, silicon and silicon isotopes, and then uh, sulfur isotopes. And we search for pre-solar grains in a, a carbonaceous contract. Uh, I show you a picture on the right, the LEP03117 meteorite. We, choose that, we chose that meteorite because it's a, a classified as a type 3.0 meteorite. And the, the, the reason we chose, the reason that's important to us is because uh, type 3.0 are um, among the least uh, altered meteorites, so they experience very little aqueous alteration or thermal metamorphism, and so they are the most likely to have preserved the most pre-solar grains, allowing us to identify higher abundance of uh, pre-solar grains. So here you can see uh, the the grain that I'm going to be talking about, it's a grain is labeled as uh, LEP149, is a croissant shaped uh, grain. And you can see here on the left, secondary electron uh, image of the grain. Um, it's uh, iso a carbon isotopic composition, show that the, it has a carbon 12 to ratio of 1.4. So it's um, for reference. Uh, the reference uh, solar system uh, value is on the order, it's on the order of uh, 89. So it's, uh, it's much, much much lower than uh, uh, the solar system value that gave us a delta uh, carbon 13 of uh, 62,000 per mil. So it's a really huge isotopic anomaly. It's among the, the lowest carbon 12 13 ratio ever measured in solar system, uh, in the solar system. It also has um, an enrichment in nitrogen 15, and then it shows a normal isotopic composition in silicon, sulfur, and oxygen. 
we also use another technique use OJ nanoprobe that uh, give us that allows us to obtain elemental information so the advantage of uh, OG spectroscopy is the only measure the few first nanometers of the surface of the sample and so it gives us elemental information on uh, the really top surface of the sample uh, avoiding any uh, interference with material from uh, the surrounding and so as you can see the grain show that it's mostly composed of carbon with uh, uh, very little oxygen uh, and it's a false color map so the carbon is in red and silicon is in green as you can see while it's surrounded by a lot of uh, silicate the grain itself is mostly composed of carbon and it's uh, a spectra so it's an ocean spectra show you the each peaks correspond at a given element and you can see the on, only two detectable elements in the spectra are carbon and oxygen <coughs> confirming that it's uh, mostly composed of carbon if we look at the different um, possibility for origin of the grain so there is different type of star that could explain such a low uh, carbon um, 12 to 10 ratio one possibility will be uh, a j type star so recently uh, schmidt and i in 2019 showed that um, a lot of uh, j type star can have a, a low carbon 12 to 10 ratio and a large range of nitrogen 14 to 15 ratio and we compare that to previous observations for silicon carbide grain they showed that it's uh, it's it will match what did the um, the group of silicon carbide grain that were so-called AB grains and so that those are the black circle in the nitrogen 14 to 15 so the, the nitrogen 14 to 15 ratio in function of carbon 12 to 10 ratio so here you can see the different groups of silicon carbide grains so there is the the black circle as AB grains the main uh, the main grains are the one uh, that I saw ended in uh, yellow which are from AGB star they are called uh, mainstream grains and then there is grains from uh, Nove, a small, small portion of grain on the uh, lower well left corner that possibly from Nove, and then uh, a large array of grains that show a low nitrogen 14 to 15 ratio that come from supernova but if you look at the um, composition of LEP149 compared to uh, all the different uh, the four different groups it doesn't actually fit the four different groups and show that it's uh, carbon 12 to 10 ratio is, is uh, much lower than what is expected for even J-type stars. And also it doesn't show any of the other anomalies. So the, the J-type star will expect it to uh, ever also show um, anomaly in silicon, for example. So we don't see those anomalies either, suggesting that the grain didn't uh, condense in the J-type star. Another possibility would be uh, an origin from um, supernova and so different models uh, of supernova suggested that the, uh, and so if, if we compare sorry the, the composition of LEP149 with different uh, supernova model for example Russia and in 2002 uh, it's difficult to reach a carbon 12 to 15 ratio uh, lower than 2 and uh, nitrogen to 14 ratio of about a thousand while still remaining in a carbon rich environment so keeping a co ratio above one so, ex so it will be difficult which is uh, required which is uh, expected for the concentration of carbon rich material and so it's difficult to explain uh, the isotopic composition of um, the of our grain and if we look at more recent uh, modeling by pignatory and al in 2015 and here are two different type of uh, mixing that in a nitrogen 14 to 15 ratio in function of the carbon 12 to 15 ratio and as you can see by mixing different layer in the supernova so the different uh, layer are basically all the different uh, nucleosynthesis layer that are um, that are observed in the supernova before its explosion so mixing different layers such as the helium nitrogen helium carbon uh, oxygen carbon oxygen neon and oxygen silicon zones of the supernova together you cannot reproduce uh, the as the peak composition of LEP149. And so origin in the supernova also appears to be uh, unlikely. Another possibility would be an origin in the Nove. And so Nove is a type of binary star that basic, uh, basically is a wide a binary system with a wide dwarf and a companion star. So it's either a CO, so carbon oxygen rich or oxygen neon rich uh, wide dwarf and that's accreting uh, hydrogen gas from uh, the companion star and as um, as it, uh, when you are created enough uh, hydrogen it leads to the rapid fusion of the hydrogen leading to its explosion and if we look at the uh, model prediction 
for both uh, CO or oxygen neon novae, we see that one particular uh, model of uh, CO novae actually fit perfectly what's explained, uh, what's expected for uh, LEP 149. So here I show you nitrogen 14 to 15 ratio in function of carbon 12 to 13 ratio. And you can see the model prediction for those two as the ratio actually match uh, perfectly with a 0.6 solar mass uh, CO uh, nova. And if we also um, looked at other isotopes that we measure, so silicon and sulfur, for example, that's also consistent with um, the model prediction, so both carbon, nitrogen, silicon, and sulfur is the peak composition of LEP149 are all consistent with uh, origin in the ejecta of a low mass uh, CO nova. Five minutes, Pierre. Okay. So uh, the next step that we did then is uh, try to get more information on the microstructure of the grain. So we, we use focus ion beam to try to extract the fifth section of the grain. So here you can see a secondary electron image of the grain on the surface after the isotopic measurement. So its surface is a lot more smooth because it was spread out with the ion, um, the ion beam. And so progressively we cover the grain with um, carbon capping, uh, capping layer to protect it during the sputtering. And then we uh, add a capping layer on the surface. And you can see here is the, the, the capping layer is uh, it's literally a strip of carbon on top of the, on top of the grain. You can see the nanosynth boxes on this image. Then we uh, use the iron beam to uh, cut around the, the cross section of the grain, extract the section and attach it to a TM grid. And you can see here the section uh, on, on, the, on the right, uh, on the left, sorry, the extreme left, you can see the section attached on the uh, TM post. Then we use transmission, uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy. So you reduce two uh, different um, TMs. So it's uh, uh, from uh, Itachi. We use a low KV, uh, <coughs> 30 KV uh, STEM SCM, and then the uh, Hitachi HF5000 at the University of Arizona to get information on the composition, mineralogy, and microstructure of the grain. So here I show you two, uh, three different uh, images. So the, the the type of image doesn't really matter for, for the purpose of the talk, but it basically show you uh, the overall uh, structure of the section. You can see the section is very, very thin. So the bottom of the part, the section was actually spread out away because we tried to make the section as thin uh, as possible to be com completely electron uh, transparent for, uh, to not get inform, uh, to ensure that we don't have um, material uh, uh, from the surrounding material that will affect the measurement. And as you can see, the grain is here at the top of the section as labeled as graphite with the marker around it. If we look at the, the particular, the grain itself, uh, we see that the grain is, uh, I show um, two different rims, the rim at the top, that's basically a rim from the nanosynth measurement that's due to uh, the iron beam damage. And then it's surrounding at the bottom by uh, another rim that was not exposed to the iron beam. So this rim, it's actually a genuinely a genuine rim that's not due to any laboratory measurement. The graphite grains is here in the, the bright in the middle, but it also show an inclusion. So there is uh, this uh, different contrast uh, inclusion. And as you can see in the schematic, I show you this, the inclusion in red and uh, the surrounding graphite in uh, gray. If we look at really high resolution imaging, you can see that we can see those um, lines that are consistent with what have been observed for uh, graphite. And I show you an example for pre-solar graphite. You can see those lines uh, cons uh, show you that uh, the pre-solar uh, graphite uh, is expecting to have a, a stacking of graphing sheet with a, a spacing of uh, 0.3 uh, for nanometers, which is consistent with what we observed. So we see that the, the, the line has basically distant, uh, we have a, a distance of 0 0.34 nanometers consistent with um, uh, graphite, and because it's a not, no, no, we don't observe really long uh, strips of uh, graphene sheet, but with those uh, smaller uh, uh, lines, it's consistent with nanocrystalline graphite grains. So the grains is actually composed of nanocrystalline graphite. If we look at the um, elemental composition, so we did uh, EDS, we use EDS to get elemental maps. You see that the, the graphite, as expected, is mostly composed of carbon. So you can see the carbon map in the, the gra uh, carbon map in red, so that the graphite grains is really composed of uh, carbon. However, the inclusion is uh, not carbon rich, but it's oxygen rich in the uh, map in, on the left side showing that it's oxygen rich in blue. If we look in more detail, you see that uh, false color imaging of the, 
uh, elemental maps with silicon in green, oxygen in blue, and carbon in red. You see that the inclusion is mostly composed of uh, silicate and uh, oxide. And if we look at the magnesium and iron, uh, magnesium in pink and iron in green, you can see that it's a mixture of uh, magnesium silicate and iron and aluminum oxide. So this inclusion is actually a mixture of both silicate and oxide-like material. And so it's the first, this actually composed, consisted the first observation of an association of oxygen-rich uh, grains inside of a carbonaceous uh, prisola grains, either silicon carbide or graphite. And so it was because both uh, material were uh, expected to condense in very different uh, environments so that we didn't expect to find them uh, associated to each other. One minute, Pierre. Okay. So let me skip the rim. I'm going to just go to the uh, end. So to explain the, the, main, the, main, the main point that I wanted to show here, it's uh, that the oxygen rich inclusion inside of, uh, of the graphite could reflect either two, two different things. So it could reflect spatial or temporal variation in the nova ejecta. So temporal variation will explain that uh, you form the inclusion uh, first and then you form graphite around it. And then you form the rim at the bottom. However, this doesn't work because astronomical observation shows that uh, carbon rich uh, does form uh, before the silicate. So they were, there is observation of, uh, uh, um, of this, uh, Nova ejecta for several years that show that carbon rich does form first. And so that doesn't work. And so the, the, the other possibility would be spatial variation where um, the silicate uh, inclusion uh, form and the graphite inclusion form in different parts of the ejecta and then um, a large scale uh, transport in between the ejecta explain the formation of the uh, graphite around the silicate inclusion. And this is actually consistent with observation of Nova ejecta, where you can see that the, it's a, that's a composite image of the JK plus I uh, Nova ejecta showing you that basically material is really clumsy. So the dust is really clumsy. And so that's consistent with our observation where condensation of oxygen rich and uh, carbon rich materials or graphite in, uh, could form in different places, but large scale transport will explain the transport of the oxygen rich inclusion into a carbon rich region where graphite condense around it. And so I would like to uh, leave you here with these two images. So in, in that quote from Victor Hugo, and I hope that in my talk today, I show you this brief example that uh, astronomy and um, laboratory analysis of pre-solar grains are complementary and that they show they basically uh, give us complementary information. And uh, as Victor Hugo said in Maybe Zero, where the telescope ends, the microscope begins which of the two is a greater view. And I like this comparison of those two images where you can see on the left, it's, a, it's just a uh, regular image of a night uh, stellar sky. And on the right side is um, gold mount with pre-solar grains, silicon carbide grain in this particular um, top and showing that each bright spot on the right side image corresponds to a single star. I would be happy to answer any question. Thank you, Pierre. Big, we're all applauding. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have, that was great. Thank you so much for the overview. So we do have a question. Uh, Philip Stancil would like to know, would, uh, uh, what effect would processing of the grain in the ISM have on the 12C, 13C ratio? So it could actually, so, so, so what, there is two things. So, so the, I didn't, I didn't manage to I, I run out of time, but I didn't really talk about it, but the, the, the rim, the rim, because the rim is at the bottom, the rim, the rim is likely to be protecting the grain. And so it seems that the, well, what we expect is the rim actually reflect um, processing in the ISM. And so, so I will assume that the um, processing in the ISM will affect the surface of the grain. And so you probably will have some mixing of, of uh, material from uh, ISM with material from the grain. So you could uh, get some isotopic dilution. So you will actually decrease the anomaly on parcel on part of the grain. Uh huh. Any other questions for Pierre? Uh, oh, we're getting one typed in, Charles. Uh, I think we only have part of it. Um. All right, Charles Cowley is writing a question, but Charles, just so you know, I only see half of a sentence, so I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> Um, 
But I'll ask uh, just a quick question. So Pierre, do you anticipate with the sample return missions, do you anticipate some advances in this knowledge um, based on what we can get from the, like OSIRIS-REx, for example? Yes, so, so the, the advantage with the OSIRIS-REx mission is we know that the grain won't be affected by any processes uh, during the transport of the, oh. like meteorite, the, the meteorite came all the way here. So, so we know, but we know that, uh, Meteorite come up from asteroids, so we we expect to find pre-solar grains in uh, some of from Osiris Rex. So that, that's going to give us basically the context of where those pre-solar grains actually res reside mm. during all this time, and so that we give us more a uh, more insight into um, pre-solar grains directly in asteroid rather than having them from um, processed meteorites in some ways. Because even in the most pristine meteorites such as the meteorite I looked at here, they, they do experience a significant alteration process in some ways. Cool. And um, we have to go to the next talk, but I'll just add sure. if you can answer this next one quickly. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned early in the solar system, uh, this is from Charles Cowley, you mentioned early in the solar system history that the solid was recondensed, so what fraction was not vaporized? And then... So in terms of abundance, it's very it's very small. So pre-solar grains are on the order of just a hundred uh, part, well, yeah, up to two hundred part per million. So it's a, it's much less than a percent. So most most of the material was actually destroyed. Was actually destroyed. So it's it's way less than a percent. Great. Thank you so much, Pierre. We're going to move okay. on to the next talk. Thank you. So if you stop your share, um, and then uh, our next talk is by. Ella Siama O'Brien uh, and co-authors are Contreras and Salama. And the uh, talk will be on scanning electron microscopy study of cosmic grain analogs produced in the NASA Ames Cosmic Simulation Chamber. So, Ella. Good morning, everyone. Let me see if I can get this going. Um, okay. Whoop. Can you see my slides and not my presenter no. mode? No, okay. You're good. you're good. Okay. So yes, today I'm going to close this for a second. Okay. So yes, I'm going to talk about the scanning electron microscopy study that we've conducted on cosmic grain analogs that we produced at the NASA Ames Cosmic Simulation Chamber facility at NASA Ames. Um, so this work was done by myself, Cesar Contreras, and Farid Salama at NASA Ames, and I'm just going to go directly to the first slide. The idea, whoops. Um, the motivation for this work is to do laboratory studies of carbon grains to try and um, follow the evolution from carbon molecules to dust grains in the outflow of carbon stars. So this schematic is really nice. It, lo it shows how you go from small molecules to much larger molecules, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and then formation of dust grains in a dust condensation zone in the outer circumstellar envelope. And this is what we're trying to simulate in the laboratory. And so to do that, we use the cosmic simulation chamber, which was developed at NASA Ames to generate, process, and analyze interstellar, circumstellar, and planetary analogs at low temperature. And the way we do this is that we, um, we use a pulse planar expansion to uh, cool down a gas mixture. Uh, so this is done by expanding a gas through a very thin slit that you can see here on this picture. It's a 10 centimeter long slit and 127 micron in size. And so we expand the gas, we pump the gas through that slit and we create an adiabatic expansion that cools down the gas to 150K in that second slit that is slightly wider and then farther down to 50 Kelvin. And then in the stream of that expansion, we use electrodes that are here. Uh, we apply a high voltage between 700 volts and 1000 volts. And that's generating a plasma, which is our energy source to uh, dissociate and ionize these uh, gas mixtures, these precursors in our expansion to induce chemistry. And so from there, we can uh, look at the evolution of the gas phase to monitor the evolution from the gas molecular precursor to much larger mo molecules and then eventually aerosols using two in situ diagnostic. We have a reflectron time of flight mass spectrometer and a UV visible and soon infrared cavity ring down spectroscopy system. And then we also produce um, aerosols, so grain particles, solid particles that we can then collect 
on different substrates by putting substrate in front of the expansion, in the stream of the expansion to jet deposit these grains that are accelerated in the expansion. And then we can collect them and do different ex situ analysis like visible infrared spectroscopy, scanning electron microscopy, and other analysis that I'm not going to talk about today. And so uh, if you want to learn more about the cosmic, please uh, check Farid Salama's poster, I poster tomorrow in the lab, the laboratory astrophysics division I poster session. For the, the study that I'm going to talk about today, we did a gas phase analysis with the mass spectrometer um, a few years back to look at the products of the chemistry. And so Contreras and Salama did a very thorough study with a lot of different hydrocarbons seeded in argon uh, expansions and looking at the products of the chemistry. So this shows you for the argon methane plasma and the argon acetylene plasma. So for argon methane, we produced uh, carbon two um, products. And then with acetylene, we went farther in the chemistry because we start with a heavier precursor and we have time to go farther in the chemistry. And if you have questions about that, we can talk about it at the end. Uh, but then the idea of this study was to look at the solid phase and to produce cosmic grain analogs from argon methane and argon acetylene mixtures and uh, change only one parameter to be able to see what the effect of changing that precursor was on the uh, morphology and size distribution of these grains. And so that's the only thing that we changed in the experiments. We put 5% methane and 5% acetylene, but we kept the same high voltage on the electrodes, the same pressure, the same temperature. And so to form carbon dust grains, we, uh, we can form them from various mixtures in the in cosmic from hydrocarbons seeded in argon, in the argon supersonic jet expansion. Um, we also have a way to include polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We have a liquid cell for benzene and toluene. So we have different ways. Here we decided to do argon methane and argon acetylene from gas bottles, uh, from gas mixtures. And then the grains can be deposited, as I said earlier, on different uh, substrates. Here you can see a KBR window and a transmission electron microscopy grid. It's a small copper grid. Um, and then we run the experiments from three hours to 40 hours, depending on the ex situ analysis that we want to conduct afterwards. And then we have a glove box where we can collect these samples when they're made um, under argon atmosphere. And these are examples of the, the samples once we collected them. And so the objective of this study was to look at the effect of the precursor on the morphology and the growth structure of the grains. And for that, we use scanning electron microscopy to really look at these grains. So these are um, the examples of images that we got with these two mixtures. So argon methane, argon acetylene, all of these are on the same scale. All of these are on the same scale. So you can see that we have variations in sizes and shapes. Uh, I wanted to point out that this, the scale here is 100 nanometer. Here it's 500 nanometer. So to show you the change, this is if you put them on the same scale. So with acetylene, we clearly see that we have larger grains, but we wanted to do a statistical analysis to demonstrate that. And so what we did is that we looked at um, low magnification images and we were able to count the particles and measure their minor and major axis to be able to look at their size, but also their shape. And what we found looking at the size distribution was that as expected, uh, as initially thought, argon acetylene was producing much larger grains and also in larger quantities. Um, we got a production yield of 1.2 grains per micrometer square per hour for the argon acetylene versus 0.9 grains per micrometer square per hour for the argon methane. And then we looked at the minor axis versus major axis uh, to be able to see uh, if these grains were spherical or not. So the green line here would be where spherical particles would fall. And so you, this is a logarithmic scale. So you can see that we deviate from the spherical shape more with argon methane with, than with argon acetylene. But to visualize it better, we did a histogram showing the major axis to minor axis ratio. And you can clearly see that the argon acetylene uh, grains uh, are much more spherical than the argon methane. Um, and so, Oh, I, I was fast. Um, so <laughs> so this, this study has demonstrated that um, in cosmic, we can produce uh, carbonaceous grains starting from small gas phase hydrocarbon molecules at low temperature, uh, so less than 200 Kelvin. And we can uh, simulate the chemical processes that are occurring in circumstellar envelopes in the gas phase at low temperature. 
uh, the, this particular study showed that the gas precursor uh, used in the experiments can influence the production yield, the morphology, and the size of the grains. So acetylene produces more grains than methane, and uh, it produces larger and more spherical grains than, uh, than methane. Um, and this observation um, can be explained by the fact that in our experimental setup, um, we, uh, and so I'm going to go in more detail, that's great, I have more time. So the, what I showed earlier with the, with the gas phase uh, mass spectra data, showing that when we put uh, methane, uh, we go to, we produce certain types of molecules, and then when we put acetylene, we produce larger molecules. What we found with the gas phase analysis was that in our experimental setup, because we accelerate the gas through the slit, um, we have a residence time of our gas in the plasma cavity, in the plasma discharge, that is very short. It's like less than four micrometer, mi microseconds. And so what you do is that you have time to break the molecules, make them interact with, with each other and produce larger molecules and grains, but then they get, go past the electrodes and then you truncate the chemistry. But by, by doing that, then you can look at different steps of the chemistry. And so this is what we observed in the gas phase and this is what we seem to observe in the solid phase as well, where with methane, we do produce grains that are smaller because we have less um, chemical products to produce these grains and we don't go as far in the chemistry. And then with acetylene, we go farther in the chemistry and we produce larger grains. And so that could be representative of different stages of formation of the grains where you have a more planar growth at first, followed by a more spherical uh, growth later on. So this was really an interesting uh, find. And so the next step now is to look at the optical constants from the visible to the mid infrared of these grains to provide that to the scientific community. And so I wanted to show you uh, the first results that we have uh, of refractive indices of the argon methane 955 gas mixture for the cosmic grains we produced, uh, the real and imaginary part. And so we got the uh, N and K value from 0.4 to 1.6 micrometer um, from uh, a commercial entity called Filmmetrics. Um, and so we got these N and K values. And then we used the NASA Ames optical constant facility that was recently, recently developed uh, to characterize the optical properties of our grains um, in the mid infrared and, and determine the N and K value. And so these are optical, these optical constants are critical input parameters in radiative transfer models, protoplanetary disk models. And so we're really excited to be able to sh give that to the community soon. So and you, um, it's about one minute, Ella, if you want to keep going. I'm done. Okay, thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. Yay. Um, so we have a question from Juan Camilo Zapata. What do you mean by going further in the chemistry? So what's, um, what's happening in our experimental setup is that you have gas that is flowing at uh, supersonic speed through, let me see if I can go back. Whoop. So I'll try and show you here. So here you accelerate your, ah, no, technology. Okay, so yes, you, you accelerate your gas and um, your plasma discharge is here between the anode and cathode. Um, and so the gas stays for three microseconds in that region and then it passes the electrodes and no chemistry is occurring in the expansion. And so what you do is that if you start with a heavier precursor, you'll have larger molecules that will start interacting with each other faster as if it was the, the products of the argon methane um, chemistry that you re-inject so that you can go farther in the chemistry. That's what I mean by going farther in the chemistry. Is that just that you have, as, as, if, as if you were increasing your time in the plasma discharge, but in fact, it's just that you put heavier molecules initially, and so then you get larger molecules in your products. If that makes okay. sense. Thank you. And one more question from Amanda Hendricks. Um, can you derive optical constants in the UV? So we have funding to buy the instrument to do that but we haven't done that yet. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, I don't think anyone can type in 
two seconds. But thank you, Ella. That was great. Um, and we'll move on to the uh, second to last talk by Tom Zaga, co-author Lucy Zuris and from the University of Arizona. And the title is Phosphorus in Chondritic Meteorites Beyond Schreber site? Beyond Schreber site? Question mark. Yep. Beyond Schreber site. Schreber, thank you. Sorry. Schreber sure. site. Can you, can you see the screen? Can you, can you see the screen, Rachel? Sorry, yes, I can, we, we're good, thank you. Okay, great, okay, thanks. Right, so uh, I'm talking about phosphorus and chondritic meteorites. So uh, phosphorus is important because together with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, it plays a critical role in biochemistry. As we know, phosphorus is part of the backbone for DNA. It bonds with oxygen in these ester groups as part of the backbone for DNA and RNA. Uh, it's also important in planetary uh, materials. Uh, phosphides were actually present in the early solar protoplanetary disk, and phosphates themselves occur in and on planets. And there's an example on the right here in this image there's a material there. You can see apatite. That's from one of the Apollo uh, samples. And apatite has volatile materials in it. Its chemical formula is here. So it's one of these phases that can trap uh, volatiles like chlorine, fluorine, uh, hydroxy groups, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we know that phosphorus also occurs in organic compounds and meteorites uh, in the form of alkyl phosphonic acids. Um, that have been uh, separated out of primitive meteorites. So phosphorus figures prominently in biochemical processes, but there's some questions as to why it should figure prominently. It has a very low cosmic abundance of three times 10 to the minus seven relative to hydrogen. It's not even among the top 10 most abundant elements in the solar system. It only has one stable isotope, phosphorus 31, and thermodynamically, it appears to be sequestered um, into metal type compounds. And so on the right here is a uh, table of, uh, of, of thermodynamic uh, stability predictions, uh, phases as a function of condensation temperature. This is by Katarina Waters in 2003 in APJ. And you can see uh, phosphorus is sequestered in this phase called Schreibersite. Uh, Fe3-phosphide. So Schreibersite uh, occurs in, in a number of different types of meteorites, including iron meteorites, and it's been speculated that perhaps these are the source of phosphorus for, uh, for the early Earth. But once sequestered in this kind of material, uh, the phosphorus itself is not highly reactive uh, or easily converted into organic uh, compounds. So the questions that we've been asking ourselves in, in, our, in our studies here uh, is, were there alternative carriers for phosphorus other than this phase called triberzite uh, and apatite in meteorites? How do these compounds compare with interstellar and circumstellar phosphorus-bearing molecules? Uh, and then ultimately, what is the life cycle of phosphorus from its formation in uh, evolved stars? Uh, ultimately, it's transport into molecular clouds and then perhaps even into uh, stellar forming protoplanetary uh, disks and other planetary systems. So our work is multi-dimensional uh, uh, here. So the, myself and Lucy Zuris uh, are trying to tie together the solid state and the gas phase uh, phosphorus distribution. So uh, we're looking at both meteorites in the solid state and also uh, circumstellar and uh, interstellar clouds uh, in the gas phase. For this talk, uh, I'm focused only on the solid state. So we've been looking at meteorites and a range of different types of meteorites, uh, ordinary and um, carbonaceous chondritic meteorites. So for this study, we've looked at mildly heated, pristine, and even aqueously altered meteorites. Uh, their names are shown here. Uh, the Bishonpur LL3.1 ordinary chondrite, which has been slightly heated. And then um, a series of uh, type 2 meteorites, carbonaceous in nature, that have experienced some hydration 
and then a type one carbonaceous chondrite, which has experienced lots of uh, aqueous processing. We have available, available to us, but not yet measured, um, some type 3O carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, their names are shown here. They're not particularly important other than to say that these are meteorites that have largely escaped any kind of processing and are believed to be pristine remnants from the early solar protoplanetary disk. So we just haven't had a chance to measure them yet. So these are our methods. I won't go into detail on these. You've heard uh, uh, the past two talks. I've mentioned these kinds of techniques. They're electron beam techniques, laboratory-based techniques, including um, the scanning electron microscope, in this case, the electron microprobe, um, something called a FIB uh, scanning electron microscope, and then a transmission electron microscope. Uh, the point here is that combining these techniques, these laboratory-based techniques, allows us to interrogate materials from the centimeter scale down to the atomic and identify where different elements are located and what their chemistry and structure looks like. Okay, so our workflow generally starts with imaging of a sample. Usually we look at it with uh, what's called backscatter electron imaging, which is just a fan of saying uh, we form images that have contrasts that are sensitive to atomic number, and that allows us to see chemical heterogeneities in our sample. Uh, once that's done, we then map the whole sample for its major rock forming elements, such as iron, magnesium, silicon, oxygen, and of course, phosphorus. Uh, we identify where local phosphorus enrichments occur. And then once we know that information, we perform higher scale mapping. Uh, we look for element correlations like calcium, phosphorus, and oxygen, which might give, give us insight into the phase. And then once we have that sort of qualitative information, then we do detailed quantitative stoichiometric chemical analysis. And then once we have the, the lay of the land, so to speak, uh, we select very representative locations for very detailed atomic scale analysis with transmission electron microscopy prefer, prepared by this FIB uh, technique. In our case here, this is my confessional for the day. Uh, we completed uh, one through three here before the pandemic hit, uh, but then the university shut down and we weren't allowed into the lab. So what I'm going to show you today is somewhat preliminary, uh, but it still gives us some useful insights on where, where to go from here. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you a series of images of what these things look like uh, with some mention as to what we have found thus far. So. This is uh, one of the, the meteorites we looked at called the Vishenpur LL3.1 ordinary chondrite. It's nearly pristine, although it's experienced some mild heating. This is a backscattered electron image or an atomic contrast uh, image. And you can see lots of objects in here like chondrules. These are the objects by which chondrites get their name. And then they're surrounded by finer grain material that's referred to as the, as the matrix. So this gives us an idea of what's in the sample. And then we have to map it for its element distribution. So on the right here is a phosphorus map uh, of this same uh, region of interest or field of view. And you can see there's some areas that have local enrichments in phosphorus. So then we identify all of those and we look at them in more detail. I think in this particular sample, we identified upwards of 40 or so uh, areas of interest. So then we go and we look at these in more detail. So this is just happens to be one of the regions we looked at. This is a chondral. You can see uh, it's got uh, some higher contrast material in it. There's probably things like metal. And when we map that with the spectrometers, we find, of course, yes, that some of these high contrast regions have metal, uh, oxygen. They have some sulfur. Carbon is probably artifactual. Uh, but then there's also phosphorus in here. So we find phosphorus metal, phosphorus bearing metal on the edge of these chondrules. Uh, same thing, we also find uh, phosphorus bearing uh, material inside of the chondrule itself. This is another area of a, of a different chondrule within Vision 4. So there's phosphorus that's inside of some of these metal and sulfur bearing grains as well. So we're seeing some chemical heterogeneity here. 
Here's another one. This is actually in the matrix of the, of the meteorite. So you can see phosphorus is localized to this grain here, and it doesn't appear to correlate with anything else um, in this set of maps except oxygen. Uh, I don't have calcium shown here, but this is likely some kind of phosphate material. Uh, and then another example of a sort of core shell particle grain in the matrix. So you can see this intricately layered grain here. It's rich in phosphorus, it has oxygen in it, uh, and probably some other elements that didn't show up in this particular map. Okay, moving on to Murchison. So this is a, a type two meteorite that's experienced some alteration. You can see all the areas of interest here. Uh, and I'll just show you again these. So here's a grain in high contrast. It appears to contain phosphorus, iron, and sulfur. So some kind of iron uh, sulfide grain with phosphorus and in solution inside of it. Uh, another um, broken down chondral inside of a uh, inside of Murchison here. You can see phosphorus is sitting within the sort of interstitial sites uh, in the chondral itself. Uh, it seems to be correlated with oxygen uh, and maybe a little bit of iron. Uh, this has probably been uh, mildly uh, altered, uh, but uh, there is phosphorus that's retained inside of that. Another example here with uh, phosphorus inside of this interstitial material in the chondral correlated with uh, uh, iron and some oxygen as well. And it appears to be part of the glassy material in the, in the chondral. Um, about one minute, Tom. Okay, so I'm just gonna flip through these. I'm not gonna point them all out because I've, I've got too many slides and I'm running out of time. Uh, but this appears to be a phosphate on the edge of a chondral. Here's what Murray looks like. We find some metal grains with a phosphorus bearing shell that's correlated with sulfur. Uh, this is a type two meteorite. Here's a iron, uh, sorry, an iron, iron sulfur phosphide uh, with an iron sulfur oxidized shell. Here's an iron sulfur phosphide uh, assemblage sitting inside of the matrix of Murray. And then probably one of the more interesting uh, objects we've identified, phosphorus inside of this iron bearing and oxygen bearing glassy material in the chondral. And then Orge, which is the most altered meteorite, uh, has these sort of matrix phosphates uh, sitting within, within the meteorite. Okay, so uh, just to kind of summarize this, the pre preliminary work shows that there's a variety of carrier phases for phosphorus. There's phosphorus-bearing metal on chondrules, phosphorus-bearing material in chondral glass in Bishanpur, phosphorus-bearing metal sulfide in chondrules, and phosphorus-bearing oxides in the matrix. In the type two meteorites, there's, uh, sorry for the typo, phosphorus and matrix metal sulfide assemblages, phosphorus and chondral glass, which is quite interesting, um, and matrix metal sulfide phosphorus assemblages. In orge, we find uh, phosphates. So the electron microprobe data suggests that Schreibersite, this iron nickel phosphide phase, probably occurs in uh, materials like, or meteorites like fission pore. Uh, but there's other oxidized and sulfidized phases that carry phosphorus. Uh, some phases, particularly those of Orge, are likely the products of parent body aqueous alteration. But metal sulfide phosphide assemblages could represent alternative carriers of phosphorus in the disk itself. And phosphorus bearing chondral glass associated with silicon might be linked to, sorry, uh, silicon phosphorus molecules in clouds that Lucy Zuries is studying. So just to summarize quickly, phosphorus is a minor but critically important element in meteorites. Uh, it probably occurs in multiple phases, both reduced and oxidized. It may have been sequestered in phases beyond Schreiberzite in the disk with potential links to interstellar molecules. But of course, once it gets into parent bodies of meteorites, it can be altered, uh, including by uh, aqueous processing and there's more work to do. Uh, which may give insight into how it was delivered to the early Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Great. Um, so we'll try to answer these. If you can answer as you know, the faster you answer, the more questions. We only have like a minute. But um, first of all, how do you identify all areas of interest in the sample that's um, from Juan Camilo Zapata? 
Sorry, let me see if I can bring up the Q and A. Okay, how do you identify all areas of interest in the sample? Yeah, so, I'll, I'll tell you. I can. Read the, I'll read the question. It's just so. You, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, how do we identify them? We basically map the sample. We look for every area that there is phosphorus, and we try to um, follow up those uh, reconnaissance studies with more detailed measurements. Uh, that's how we identify. It. We try. Okay. Did you mention phosphorus? Um, one. Sorry, you're breaking uh, up no, a little. Maybe that's me. Sorry. I didn't mention, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I didn't mention Whitlockite. It may be there, but that requires quantitative analysis, which was the net in the study. Um, but like I said, the pandemic hit, but that'll be one of the next things that we do is quantitative measurements. Okay, and I guess the last, if you want to answer Murti Gudapati's question, we have time. Are there, observation or Are there observations of organophosphorus compounds in these meteorites? Yeah, that's a great question. So this was one of the original motivators for the DIC was to look for organic, organic, and uh, it's very difficult to detect using the methods that uh, we have available to us in the solid state at the moment, but there appear to be a few areas where there is a carbon and phosphorus correlation and we'll, we'll follow those up um, in the future. Great. All right, unfortunately we have to go to um, the next talk, but uh, thank you so much, Tom. All right, so the next talk is, uh, it's our last talk, and this is our second invited talk of the session. So this is Leah Corrales, who will be discussing astromineralogy and dust grain growth with x-ray imaging and spectroscopy. And uh, Leah is from the University of Michigan. So Leah, thank you. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself for a moment. All right, thanks very much. Um, I'll be talking about astromineralogy and dust grain growth with x-ray imaging and spectroscopy. Um, before I begin, I just want to take a quick minute to acknowledge that it's such a privilege to be here, even virtually, because this is not a business as usual moment in our history. I'm actually speaking to you today from Detroit, Michigan, where 80% of the city population is African American and disproportionately affected by both COVID-19 and by excessive police force. So in acknowledging that, I just wanna thank everyone who is able to make it here today, but I also wanna express my sympathy and concern for colleagues that we have who can't be here today uh, due to the stress of these extraordinary times. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, I will be speaking uh, from the perspective of an observer and not someone who does lab measurements, but whose work relies very heavily on lab measurements so I'll be speaking to some of the things that are being done in the lab and some of the needs that we have in the X-ray community. Okay, from, um, just from an observational astronomy perspective, I wanna point out that we study dust for a, a number of reasons. One, we want to interpret our observations, so dust is typically a contaminating uh, source. Uh, so, for example, interpreting SCDs of star forming regions is highly dependent on our understanding of both the mineralogy and the grain sizes of the dust that's obscuring it. Um, we also study dust to understand fundamental physics from everything from cosmology. Uh, dust has a contribution towards the cosmic microwave background, uh, but we can also look at dust polarization to make maps of magnetic fields and clouds, for instance, this Orion molecular cloud. And finally, we also want to understudy, understand dust in order to understand our origins because dust is the building blocks for life and planetesimals, which many of the speakers in this session have already spoken about. Um, again, from more of an observational perspective, we tend to think of dust in the interstellar medium of having a particular life cycle where there are many questions along the way. Uh, so first, of course, we need some metals, some heavy stuff to form the dust, and that comes from stellar fusion, nucleosynthesis, or evolution, and death. 
In particular, we think that there is a lot of dust production in AGB stars and core collapse supernovae, and somewhere along the way that dust gets disseminated into the interstellar medium, but it also gets processed. It can be processed through supernovae shocks, um, leading to shattering or sputtering, um, but we, again, we also know that a lot of metals are produced by supernovae, so in, in some way, supernovae also have to contribute to dust formation. Otherwise, the dust is being formed in the interstellar medium itself. Um, finally, when the interstellar medium dust does reach colder, cooler environments, um, like molecular clouds, you get grain growth and chemical processing, often through, um, we believe, icy material collecting onto the dust grains and forming mantles. Um, and then eventually, as a star forms, this dust uh, ends up in a disk where it gets processed in a variety of ways. That is still um, an ongoing field of research, um, and the whole process starts again. So um, the thing I like to hammer home with this diagram is to point out that there are many different environments in which dust presents itself, and um, we have very different populations of dust surviving in different types of environments and a lot to study. Um, and fundamentally, what I'll be talking about is doing this in the X-ray and um, how we can use X-rays to evaluate both mineralogy, so dust composition, as well as grain size. Okay, so why in the world will we study ISM dust with X-rays to begin with? Uh, this picture you see is actually a spectacular dust echo from Circinus X1. Um, this image was made by Sebastian Hines, and it's just one of the most, uh, it's one of the most impressive ways that we've been able to study dust in interstellar medium with x-rays. Um, so in particular, the x-ray band covers photoabsorption from all the major metals, um, from carbon through iron, um, and it's basically through photo, photo absorption bumps. So um, for instance, the oxygen K edge or the N equals one photoelectric edge and also absorption features around there are very strong. And as well as iron L to name two fundamental elements. Um, but the other great thing about this is that um, because it's the X-ray, it actually, most, most dust grains in interstellar medium are optically thin to the X-ray photons. So we're actually able to separate both the gas and solid phase by looking at fine structure and absorption in the X-rays. So as an example, uh, here's a plot of absorption in the spectrum of Cygnus X2, where there are different features that are associated with atomic oxygen one. Um, as well as some unidentified features, which they attributed to a compound. Um, I'll talk more about the oxygen K uh, shell in, in detail later, um, but on the right, you'll see a plot of um, a dust template along with oxygen one and oxygen three photoabsorption cross sections if you had 1% of the oxygen in, in O3. So this is very interesting and unique because it, most other wavelengths, you're really only looking at dust or you're only looking at gas. Um, so this gives us the opportunity to use galactic X-ray binaries of pro as probes of the galactic ISM. So as an example, there's over 100 targets and 335 observations in the Chandra archive of bright X-ray binaries that could potentially be used to probe the ISM. Um, I've overlaid them on a map of dust emission from Schlegel, Finer, and Davis. Uh, so you can see there's many different types of sight lines we can probe, but most of them are in the galactic plane. And then in the upper right hand corner, there's a map from a white paper by Valencic et al, where they show how many more sight lines we're able to probe given different types, uh, or given a telescope with 10 times Chandra effective area. Uh, which at this point, um, you know, every new X-ray observatory proposed has, has about that, if not more. So um, I'll be talking more specifically about X-ray absorption fine structure because that's where we have the most diagnostic power. And I'll be talking about uh, theory of it, stuff that's been done in the lab and the frontiers of, of this science for us. Okay, so um, it's well known that in general, when you have deep photoelectric absorption uh, within heavy elements such as iron in this particular example, um, if that uh, 
if that iron atom is in a crystal or a molecule or any sort of you know nearby another atom uh, you're going to get oscillations around uh, the isolated gas phase cross-section which we call x-ray absorption fine structure um, and this fine structure is highly dependent on what types of atoms it's bonded to um, the crystallinity of the material and things like that so this is an example of a lab cross-section for the n equals 2 photoabsorption um, from Lee et al in 2009 and you can see there's many different features that arise uh, from different types of iron compounds so the goal would be to take the absorption that we see from x-ray binaries in our galaxy and match that to these templates so that we can understand what the exact mineralogy is of interstellar dust. Um, but there's some stuff you can do even if you don't have templates. So this is from um, Lee and Ravel 2005. And what they showed is that using their lab measurements, um, you can actually do a Fourier transform on the, the observed absorption profile and the oscillations in that Fourier transform correspond to um, distances of atoms in a crystalline lattice. So basically, um, you can think of exabs as perturbations on the gas phase cross-section. Um, they measure atomic spacing um, and, in general, mineral composition and crystallinity. So this is just a few examples of that uh, taken from the lab. OK, so there is still a lot of work to be done because the lab work is very difficult, and I'll talk about that in a second. But we definitely have iron K and iron L shell measurements. Um, not everything is publicly accessible at this time. Um, there are ongoing measurements by the SROM group in, um, in the Netherlands, and they're working actively on iron L, oxygen K, and carbon K. Uh, we have silicon shell also from that, from that group that's been publicly released, and iron K as well. Um, there's also some recent measurements of iron L shell from GEMS, for instance, from the Westfall et al. paper. Um, there's also some theory work on carbon K shell absorption, um, but again, a lot of this stuff is not publicly accessible, so it's hard to test at this moment. Um, and then there are various um, oxygen K and carbon K shell uh, features from molecules and ices that are used in um, an AMOL model, sorry, this is a specific model from X-ray Observatory um, software called SPECS. And so it's semi-public because that, that, sorry, that code was just recently released publicly. Um, but a lot of these measurements are, are fairly old and could take, could um, be done better, I believe, with more modern technology. Okay, another thing that's difficult about lab work in XAVS is that it's, it's very technically challenging. So every person that I've talked to that has performed lab measurements in the field of XAVS uh, cites difficulties in sample preparation, purity, and then calibration. Um, a, an additional complication is that in order to obtain a full census of all of these elements from carbon all the way to iron K, uh, you actually require a range of experimental techniques, whether it's a fluorescence technique, um, where you're actually measuring the excitation of, of the electrons in the material, or whether it's actual you know, measuring transmission of x-rays through material. Um, and something that's well known in access is the thickness effect, which occurs in experiments with optical depths of the sample that are greater than or equal to around two. And in the case of soft x-ray absorption features, particularly oxygen and carbon and things like that, it's really hard to get something that's thin enough uh, to completely avoid these effects. And then again, if you're using fluorescence techniques such as those used for the silicon K edge in the Ziegers et al. paper, um, this requires very careful treatment of self-absorption from the samples. Um, so as I speak to people in this community, I hear um, a lot of arguments or um, definitely contention around, you know, how much they trust particular measurements because the calibration is so sensitive to this thickness effect as well as um, self-absorption. Um, so I will say that progress is definitely slow, but the future is bright and things are starting to get really exciting. 
Um, so as an example, Chandra has 30 to 100 centimeters square area in the regions of interest for studying um, astro mineralogy. And then the resolution of the instrument is on the order of 500 to 1000, which um, if you're an optical astronomer is, is not high resolution at all. Um, but our next generation of X-ray telescopes have 30 to 100 times Chandra effective areas and um, much higher resolution by a factor of three to five. Um, and so that's exciting because when you do look at a lot of these sits, for example, the one on the right, um, you can fit all sorts of templates to these models, but you see very little statistical deviations. And that's simply um, an issue with signal to noise and resolution. Um, so those things are both going to get better in the um, very near future within the next 10 years. Um, and then another exciting result that came out recently from Westfall 2019, it was just the ability to start comparing these X-ray absorption fine structure features to things that we actually know of from um, some of the talks we were seeing before. Um, so I'm not showing their fits, but they're similarly statistical to the ones you see on the right. Um, but you can see that they're able to actually put their measurement, so the black lines are the contours for a fit to iron in uh, iron absorption in Cygnus X1, and they can compare it to what's expected for condensation from solar metallicity gas in terms of uh, iron sulfide versus iron and silicates versus pure metal iron. Um, so we're actually moving towards these sorts of things, uh, these sort of direct measurements of interstellar dust. And um, again, uh, a lot of these features, as our telescopes get more and more sensitive, it's just going to be difficult to ignore these features. And most X-ray astronomers just model these as edge features. And they're not going to be able to do that anymore. Uh, so here's some general things that happen to XAVs and how they tell you about the mineral characteristics. Uh, first of all, the actual position of the absorption features shift. So here's some papers from 1995 and 2002 that show that with uh, different types of um, iron, L, and silicate absorption features, you can see that they shift. Um, and another thing to point out is that um, in studying XAVs, we're actually uh, pushing theory and lab uh, work that affects fundament our understanding of fundamental physics. Um, so in, in the early days of Chandra, for instance, um, people were comparing all of their absorption features in the oxygen to just oxygen one. And they said, well, I see some additional stuff. It must be a compound. Uh, but later on, people said, well, this could be oxygen two or oxygen three. And so people needed to calculate near neutral gas phase cross sections. Um, and what they saw is that you could actually attribute the majority of these features to things like oxygen two and oxygen three. Um, of course, this creates a problem because if you study anything about dust and interstellar medium, you know that there's definitely oxygen there. Um, so right now, X-ray astronomers have been looking at the oxygen K shell features and saying, we don't technically need dust. Um, what that could tell us is that dust is somewhat featureless in the oxygen K region. Um, but in general, there's still a lot to be made up there. So that's created a lot of um, conflicting results. Um, but another thing that's interesting is that in doing a lot of this work, people have actually been able to use Chandra to calibrate the lab measurements of, for instance, oxygen features. So here on, um, in this plot, you see the theoretical cross sections um, from oxygen one to oxygen three compared with oxygen one is measured in the lab. And when they compare that to Chandra observations, they actually have to shift the positions of um, many of these key features, which we call benchmarking. Um, and it's led, it led to some controversy, but ultimately it was decided that um, the O1 lab measurements were using um, a calibrator that was not quite right, um, and they were all using the same calibrator, so now we've switched to the, the Chandra calibration. So atomic cross-sections benchmarked with things like Chandra can be considered the gold standard at this point. So we're using astronomy also to benchmark the lab. Um, and absolute energy scaling in the lab is a huge issue uh, for astromineralogy right now. So here's a, a concrete example. Um, what some of the latest models for iron L absorption have shifted the iron L lab data, 
data in order to match the features that we actually observe in the intracellular medium. Uh, so, for example, there's this portrait and Kim metallic iron sample that people used for INL absorption, um, but it had to be shifted for the ISM, that's that red dotted line. And then on the right, you actually see um, those same lab cross-sections from Lee et al. 2009, and um, I put a black vertical line and a red vertical line to represent the Courtright and Kim uh, features versus the shifted ones in ISM abs. This is just the model that some people are using. Um, and you can see that that shift roughly corresponds to two different um, compound types in iron L. So the question is, is this um, a fundamental energy scaling issue or is this actually a mineral issue or, you know, is this actually caused by different minerals in the ISM? So we really can't fundamentally identify minerals um, and unless we're completely confident in our ground-based lab calibration. Okay, and um, I'll talk really quick about um, x-ray scattering because it's, uh, it's kind of my forte. So um, you definitely need to also incorporate the effects of dust scattering when you're studying x-ray absorption fine structure. Um, so just a quick, um, quick introduction to dust scattering. Basically, ISM dust produces arc minute scale scattering halos and that's just because the scattering cross section for interstellar dust um, is relatively high, but it's over a very small angle, um, usually just a few arc minutes. And because it's such a small angle, we're actually able to capture, recapture that scattered light around point sources um, when we have telescopes of sufficient resolution. So there's an example of a scattering halo on the lower left. Um, and this uh, scattering cross section is also immensely sensitive to grain size, so grain size to the fourth power. Um, now, um, these produce really beautiful uh, light echoes when you have a variable source, but when you're looking at a spectrum, what you're also doing is, um, depending on the resolution of your instrument, you're introducing an extra extinction component from scattering. So um, on the lower, uh, the lower plots here show the iron L edge um, using some basic optical constants and um, what happens to it when you change the grain size. Um, the scattering goes way up and the absorption goes down due to shielding. Um, and also as you change the telescope um, imaging resolution, which is what the blue lines show. About four minutes, Leah. Thanks. Um, and uh, this is just another plot that shows you, um, for instance, the Hoffman and Drain paper shows how you can have effects due to scattering on the XF structure, depending on whether or not you have spherical grains or elongated grains. Um, and then the other thing that I wanna point out about the scattering is that on the low energy or the long wavelength side of the absorption features, you get a little blip in the absorption cross section so that when you actually look at the real spectrum, you actually see something that goes up. Uh, so that's sometimes referred to as the scattering peak because uh, it's almost like a fake emission feature. Um, so people have started to claim that there is a peak that arises, for instance, in silicon K shell absorption that's coming from um, some very large grains because the large grains are the ones that scatter. So um, we have this GX5 minus one result from Zegers et al, where they say they need a power law distribution of 0.1 to 0.5 micron size grains in order to mimic um, this upswing in the spectrum that you see here. And then Schultz et al did not do a fit, but they just said mm, maybe this feature right here is due to scattering. Um, so in order to actually do these measurements and to do these models, we, we need the complex index of refraction, which is not always what people are publishing. Um, we need to compute the scattering from first order principles in order to account for the effects of self blanketing or basically shielding within the large grains, um, which not every measurement has taken into account. Um, so this is just something that's really important. I'm always asking for these complex index uh, the complex index of refraction. Um, and it's also essential if we want to model more complex grain structures, such as grains with mantles or mixed features grains um, and things like that. So that's what we're looking for.
Okay, um, I will go really quickly through some interesting questions that we're looking to answer with X-ray uh, with X-ray studies of the interstellar dust. One, we want to know what's going on with oxygen. Um, we need to be able. Uh, we know that there's more oxygen depleted in the ISM than it is available for silicon and magnesium to soak up. Um, this is a case for water ices and large composite grains, which is really great for X-rays uh, to study. Uh, we also just want to know the absolute abundances of metals in the ISM because a lot of that is based on assumptions around depletion and what we see in just gas phase absorption. Uh, another big question is how much dust survives supernovae and how does iron dust form? So we know that the majority of iron in the interstellar medium is produced by a type 1a supernovae where we don't really see um, evidence for dust being formed and yet iron is depleted very heavily and easily in the ISM. So is it forming in the diffuse ISM? Um, and if so, how is it being incorporated into larger dust grains that aren't just iron? I talked briefly about the oxygen problem that we're having. Um, so I'll just glaze through this. Um, right now, people are fitting oxygen without solids. Um, and that's something we need to fix. Um, and that's something that requires lab measurements. Um, one of the ways to solve this problem is to look directly at the X-ray spectrum of the scattering halos that we see, and this is what I'm working towards doing. Um, here on the left, you can see basically a scattering opacity, so something like the spectrum you would expect to see from a just scattering halo where there are distinct features coming from each particular element in the dust grains. Um, you can also look at um, the broadband spectrum of the source in order to look for uh, oxygen features. So here's one where it was done at very low resolution and they do see some oxygen features. So again, uh, we do expect that. And then I'm on the CRISM science team, which is the next generate or the next X-ray telescope that will be launched that will have um, imaging spectroscopic capabilities. And this is a, a prediction for GX339-4, where we could see scattering features from solid oxygen. Uh, one minute, Leah. Thanks. Um, OK, so I will just go forward to a few other things. Uh, one thing we're worried about are effects from the local environment. So because we are looking at X-ray binaries, there is some variability and there is some contamination from higher, um, higher ions. Um, but in general, we're able to, to get uh, particularly robust results when we look at populations of, um, of different X-ray binaries. Um, right now, we have a sense that um, absolute ISM abundances need to be adjusted when we look at these. So this is an example from Schultz et al. where we see that the silicon K-shell absorption depths are just generally stronger than expected. Um, and we need some adjustments to some of our ISM abundance models. And I just want to point out that um, the most exciting thing is that we're going to be seeing a lot of these scattering echoes and scattering halos. So this is a paper uh, where we looked at all of the X-ray binaries in the sky and made predictions for how many of those spectacular dust echoes we're going to see, just like the one I, I showed earlier. Um, and for CRISM, you can see that we'll, we're generally expecting to see three to five times more um, X-ray spectacular dust echoes, um, but the next generation, such as Athena and Lynx, uh, we'll see over 30 times. So we're talking about, you know, a few dust echoes a year versus uh, one every three or five years. Um, okay, and the last point I want to make is that X-ray grading instruments are really the best at probing a larger population of dust uh, because X-ray gratings um, give you better resolution at the soft x-ray end than any of the x-ray IFU type instruments that are being developed now. Um, and in particular, they're necessary for looking at carbon and oxygen because a lot of the x-ray IFU instruments um, really cut off at, at around a half keV. So um, we want to see these, these uh, elements, which are very important, as you all know. And um, we also want to be able to expand our measurement of, uh, from local ISM to extragalactic ISM at higher redshift. So that requires softer x-rays. So um, this is just 
a plug for Argus and Lynx, which would potentially have X-ray gratings on them. So I will leave, uh, leave off here with some conclusions and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Yay, everyone's clapping. Um, so we do have one question so far, and that is from Murti Gudapati. Uh, the energy, regarding the energy spectral line widths, can they be improved in the lab and on the telescopes? And are they a limiting factor? And if so, why? Um, the spectral line widths. Or the um, energy spectral widths is how he. Energy spectral is. I'm, I'm guessing that means can, uh, if you're there, you can type a clarification. Yeah, um, I'm guessing uh, that means like energy resolution. I, yeah. I, well, how, I guess just answer it how you feel. Yeah. Uh, there's a limiting factor <laughs> that he can clarify. He meant the line with res resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so in general, um, it's been shown that the best. Let's just say. Um, so even with line widths or I'm thinking of the line spread function when you're when you're looking at high resolution X-ray spectroscopy. In general, um, we're getting like five EV resolution with um, our next generation instruments, and it will be even better for Athena. Um, it's definitely good enough um, to do some fundamental measurements of, for instance, um, those two peaks that I was showing in. in iron. Here we are. Um, some of the other uh, smaller features definitely tend to get smoothed out even with like 5 EV resolution. Um, but uh, definitely these shifts are, are resolvable. I hope that answers the question. Okay. I would say the, I would say the um, limiting and factor is more signal to noise. All right, thank you. And one last question before we um, finish the session from Randall Smith. He writes, in the optical UV, astronomers use drains, astronomical silicate, optical constants rather than lab measurements because the lab measurements never seem to agree with IS dust. Do you think X-rays, once seen with enough resolution, will have similar problems or is this an easier problem than optical UV? <laughs> Well, we're going to see a lot of discrepancies, I think, um, from the drain model um, because it is very much approximated. Um, I think that my hope for the future in x-rays is to use the observations to make our templates for ISM dust um, and that we can back out some of the information uh, from those templates directly from our lab measurements. So I do expect a lot of discrepancies um, I expect a lot of mysteries, and um, I think that answers the question. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. You can talk offline, too. Um, he yeah, said he gave a thumbs up. So thank you, everyone, for attending. This was really fun, I have to say, and exciting and great talks. Thank you so much. It was our first LAD session, and please come back at 2.50. We have our astrochemistry session today, and also LAD's business meeting is tonight at 6.40 p.m., well, Eastern time, so... Uh, Eastern uh, Daylight Time, yes. Uh, so anyway, thank you all. And um, thanks to the tech support people, Travis in the background, and I thought it was great. So, and I can't hear anyone disagreeing with me. So it was great. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> okay, thank you. And thank you thank to all our speakers. Thanks a lot and have fun at the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Thanks everyone.